Excellent. I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight for our reinitiation of our in-person meetings of the Nebraska Radiology Society. Uh, we have Dr. Bradley Erickson here from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, my name is Anna Frayer. Um, uh, Dr. Erickson is Professor of Radiology and Director of the Mayo uh, Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. He's a neurologist at the Mayo Clinic with an interest in developing and applying deep learning tools for the better care of patients. He's received his numerous awards for his work, including the NVIDIA Global Impact Award and the SIIN Gold Medal. He was the chair of the American Board of Imaging Informatics and the president of the Society of Imaging Informatics and Medicine, and is a founder of three startup companies. Uh, with this talk, he'll provide a bit of background on how AI works, challenges to his application in radiology, and where it's being applied today, and is likely to, likely to be successfully applied in the near future. The talk will also cover the legal and social issues surrounding this use in radiology and medicine. I'd like everyone to thank him for coming down today and visit us, which is the uh, second time he's come to the Nebraska Radiology Society and visited. Um, but uh, everyone can thank him for your visit today. All right, well, Carmen gets my slides set up. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, it's good to see a few familiar faces. Um, some of them I remember from back at Mayo. Uh, some of them from the prior visit. Um, and the, the good news is that if you have a better memory than me and remember some of what my talk was about before, um, I was actually checking. I hate to do too much repeat talk, and 57 of the 61 slides are brand new material. And you've already seen one of the repeat slides here. So, you know, and that, that kind of reflects how dynamic AI is and in, in how it can be applied to medicine. Um, a lot of the material that I thought was really cool and cutting edge back in 2019 when I was here before um, is really passe now and we understand a lot more about what's going on. So as I mentioned, I have some startups. I don't plan to talk about any of that today. Um, so you know, I, I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll at least have some understanding of how the technology works. Not so much that you're going to write algorithms, but more so that you understand how they can fail. And that, that's really the critical thing that you need to think about if you're going to start to apply this into clinical practice. And so understanding how they are applied in clinical practice is, is another part of the component. And then um, understand how this ultimately can improve the care of our patients. And then at the end, I'll have a little bit of fun stuff about some of the, the non-radiology uh, AI things that are happening in the world. So um, this is one of the repeat slides. See, there it says old. <clears throat> and, um, you know, this was one of the things that was kind of a wake-up call for radiology. And so in 2017, Jeff Hinton, who is one of the three fathers of this new AI revolution, said that, you know, we should stop training radiologists. They're all going to be relics. AI is going to do everything they do. And um, I've actually had the good fortune of meeting him, and he is no dummy. Okay, so why would a smart person say something like that? And the reason is because of this. There's an international challenge called the ImageNet Challenge, where they collected actually around 14 million images. They then picked out one million of the best images, and then from those one million, there are about a hundred categories, sorry, a thousand categories of each different type of thing. So a cat, a dog, a plane, a train, and all that sort of thing. And the challenge was to build an AI tool that would figure out what was in the photo. And using traditional machine learning methods, they were kind of hitting a plateau somewhere around 75%. And then deep learning technology came on the scene. And that's what Jeff Hinton is, is a master of, is this deep learning technology. And you can see that there were dramatic improvements in performance. And, and actually, one of the guys who won the challenge back in 2013, who was a Stanford PhD, so he's probably above average IQ, um, actually took the test to see if he could figure out what was in the photo. Now, you can tell it's a little bit harder than cat or dog. Um, you had to know genus and species, and that like they would show a piece of a wheel, and you had to say that was from an airplane rather than a train or something like that. And so he got about 95%. And so, you know, back in 2017, you can see the trajectory. Now, the flaw with him is that he said, oh, radiologists, they look at pictures. They look at the one thing in the picture that we make the diagnosis of, end of job, right? And so that's the problem is that these were highly curated data sets with one 
and exactly one thing in each photograph. And that's not how radiology is, right? Sometimes there's nothing in the sense of it's normal, but oftentimes we have to put a lot of signs together in order to make the diagnosis. And so it was an understandable error. He's retracted it. He said, you know, we need to use deep learning to figure out how to improve the care of patients. And radiologists keep doing your great job, okay? So, so he kind of, you know, had his tail between his legs and, and understands it now. <clears throat> this is another old slide. And, you know, we use the term artificial intelligence. That's really a bad term. I hate it because it's neither artificial and it's not intelligent. Okay, but this specific area of artificial intelligence that really made the dramatic change is what's called deep learning. And it gets that term because we use something called a neural network that loosely is modeled on the brain structure where you have lots of nodes and connections and weights and such. And in the old days, we could only have like one or two layers of neurons connected and that was basically the limit of computational power, but also it didn't work that well. Well, there were some important advances made, both in computing technology, but also algorithms that allowed us to have many, many layers. Now we typically have hundreds to thousands of layers, and so that's why it's called deep learning now. So deep learning is really the revolution that happened in that 2015-2016 time frame. So, I'll use AI and deep learning interchangeably, but really AI is much broader and uh, can include things like rule-based systems or traditional machine learning, which was, again, this much more simplistic thing. Um, there are several families of deep learning. Supervised means you say, here's an example of disease X or disease Y. So you're telling it, this is an example of the data I'm feeding to you, and the right answer is whatever, as opposed to unsupervised, which essentially is, here's a bunch of examples. Can you figure out some sort of pattern that these belong together or not? Okay, I'm not going to talk about that tonight. And there's also reinforcement learning. Um, who knows what AlphaGo is? Anybody? Do you, how many know what the game of Go is? So this is kind of the next level on top of chess, where it's white, white and black uh, pebbles essentially on a much larger board than a chess board. And they say there are more moves in AlphaGo possible than uh, molecules in the universe. Okay, so it's a hard problem. And so algorithmically figuring out, well, what are all the possible moves, and then I'm going to pick the best one, is not possible with Go. So um, there was a company called DeepMind that, that trained an algorithm using re reinforcement learning to play the game of Go, and it beat the world champion, a guy named Lee Sedol, in five out of six matches. And so that was when people said, you know, there is something to this deep learning thing. Briefly, how does this work? Um, we take a large set of data, and we typically split it into training data set and validation, or sometimes it's called a test set. And, and again, there's a little bit of terminology issue, but don't worry about that for now. And in, in the old days, we would have what's called a feature vector, things like splitting events. Yeah, okay. So in the old days of traditional machine learning, we would have what's called a feature vector. So things like red, and that might be represented as a one, yellow is a two, purple is a three. Here's a number, maybe the weight in grams, and then is it spherical or not? And that would be the vector that we would feed in, and then we would say it's a apple, banana, or grape, right? So in traditional machine learning, we would figure out the correct weighting of all these different features in order to predict what the label for that was. Okay, so that's the old way that we do it. The main difference now is that we don't worry about identifying all those features so carefully. But the basic training loop is that we take all those examples and we feed that feature vector in and we multiply the numbers by weights and then it cascades through all the nodes and we adjust the weights of those nodes in order to figure out how important is the fact that it's spherical or that it's red or something. And we do that for all the examples in the training set. 
And we looked then when we adjusted the weights, did the error get worse or better? And if it got better, we keep changing the weights in that direction. If it got worse, we change the weights in the opposite direction. And we keep doing that millions to billions of times until we basically can't improve it anymore. Okay, so that's the basic concept that's going on here. And the, the key thing that happened again around that 2014, 2015 time is that people figured out how to map these calculations, the adjustment of the weights, onto graphics processing units or GPUs. Okay, now I'll ask who the real techies are. Who knows what a GPU is? Why do you want a GPU? Because it analyzes the images. I mean, you can train it to analyze the images. Wrong answer. Oh, no. Because your kids make it the, have fun with the games, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you gave the politically correct answer. Yeah. The true answer is GPUs are what make games go really fast. But the people at NVIDIA figured out how to map the calculations onto the GPUs. And so a GPU will typically have hundreds to thousands of cores, whereas like your Intel or AMD processor will have, you know, eight to 10 or something like that at the max. And so suddenly these calculations are going hundreds of times faster. And if you're gonna do that loop millions to billions of times on data sets of, you know, hundreds of thousands of images, you need to have that kind of performance speed up. Sorry for picking on you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, now, another important difference with deep learning is that typically we don't calculate the actual features like how bright is that pixel, how sharp is an edge. We instead feed the whole image in and part of that deep learning process early on is that it actually starts to learn what the features are. And so a critical thing compared to Back when I did my PhD, I did some work on uh, traditional machine learning because that's what we had available. I had to figure out how am I going to calculate the important features like in a mammogram, speculation. I had to calculate you know, how sharp was the edge, what was the power spectrum or something like that. And then I would feed it into that loop that would say, oh yeah, the edge sharpness, the intensity, all that sort of thing, that's important. Whereas with deep learning, we actually just feed in the whole image and so it learns those features. So that means either if you're dumb enough that you don't know how to calculate it, which is sometimes my case, or if you don't know what the important features are, which probably can also be the case, um, deep learning is going to do some really cool stuff that we couldn't do with traditional machine learning. So that, that, that's why deep learning is really a quantum leap forward compared to the traditional machine learning methods. There are several different classes of clinical applications that we can have for deep learning. Uh, things like regression, which essentially is predicting a, a floating point value. So things like age, of, uh, bone age, for instance, is one popular application. Um, you can do segmentation, which essentially is saying a pixel is belonging to the brain or the liver or the tumor, that sort of thing. Classification is essentially diagnosis. It's, you know, a tumor where it's benign, or it's malignant or it's benign, or it's uh, um, you know normal or it's uh, COVID or something like that, right? So again, exactly what the classes are depends on what your problem is. And then the last thing is generative, and that's some of the really cool stuff where uh, we can, uh, well, I'll show you what it is if you don't know what that means. Um, so regression, there aren't a lot of applications in medical imaging. Um, bone age is certainly a popular one because the data sets are so easy to create because there's a very stylized report that we have, right? The chronologic age is 5.2 years, the bone age is 6.3, and these things are starved for data. If you can develop a large data set with the answer, you're golden. And so bone age was one of the early uh, applications of this because we had such large data sets that were easy to get at. But another application that I think is pretty cool being a neuroradiologist is there are these large data sets called ADNI, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, and they actually can predict the age of the patient from the T1 image on brain MRI. Now, I don't know if there are neuroradiologists. I know I can't do that. I can kind of get a sense of atrophy or whatnot, but they're guessing it with a mean average error of 4.2 years. 
Now, I don't think we need MRIs to figure out how old somebody is, but kind of like bone age, these are the interesting ones, right? It's kind of like the patient who is 70, but they look like 50, or they're 50 and they look like 70, except on the brain side or the other organ side, right? I, you know, I think it will come that we'll do the same thing with livers and kidneys. That's where we can really start to add important value to, to the whole clinical care problem is, you know, if, if you see you have a problem rising that that patient's kidney looks like a 70 year old, then they probably need to see a nephrologist and, and start to pre prevent disease rather than have to treat it after it's already fulminant. Segmentation. So again, segmentation is just saying what pixels belong to the various structures. So it could be either labeling the gyri on the brain, you know, separating out the, the lobes of a lung. Um, it could be identifying the organs in the abdomen. Um, one of the early things we did is for polycystic kidney disease, now that tolvaptin is considered a treatment for a specific segment of patients, knowing kidney volumes is important. Um, so we started to deploy some tools that will do automated segmentation of tumors. Who here loves to measure tumors? Yeah, me neither. So, you know, I think this is one thing where AI actually can be a benefit to us. It's not about replacing us. It's about helping us do our job better than anybody would really like to do. And uh, I think measuring tumors and other structures probably is important, right? Today, we mostly measure, measure tumors. But obviously in cardiology, right, we measure stroke volumes and such. I think we're going to get to the point where we will routinely measure every major organ. And I think we're going to find a lot of diseases, just like with dementia, right, brain volumes and, and volumes of specific structures like hippocampi, you can start to make diagnoses. And I think that's where radiology is going to go. Um, I don't know if there are MSK radiologists out here. Um, we started to develop some tools with orthopedics and you know, measuring subsidence is a, another challenge. And here's a tool that's fully automated. It will identify the stem and it will then measure the subsidence, essentially at the level of human error. And I think, again, this is something that very few people love to do, um, but if we could do it reliably, consistently, this is where we can start to bring value. Body composition. Um, this is a tool that, that we built in my lab for measuring visceral fat, subcutaneous fat, and muscle in the abdominal wall. And this is something that a lot of clinicians love. Surgeons, the, the general surgeons love it. And in fact, there's a correlation between the amount of muscle in the abdominal wall and post-operative complications. And so if they see that a patient is sarcopenic, they typically are much are going to do a much less invasive surgery, and therefore they aren't going to have you know the patient that lingers forever in the unit, and instead they'll do a less invasive surgery and, and get the patient out. Um, oncologists love it for a similar reason, right? You oftentimes there are kind of two aggressive pathway versus a more uh, palliative approach. They love it too, and endocrinologists, you know, from from looking at various. Uh, uh, metabolic diseases, you know, it, it's amazing how many clinicians are glomming onto this as a tool that they use to help manage patients. So, you know, I think with segmentation, th there are tools now that will segment every bit in a CT of the abdomen, for instance, including even things like nerve vertebral disc volumes. It'll find uh, adrenals, it'll find, you know, renal arteries and so on. And so I think the way that we're going is something like this, where you'll have a report, and this is content that an AI tool can all generate. And it's not something that I would particularly enjoy generating, but you know, again, if you start to see that suddenly the decrease in renal volume is above some norm, that's probably a patient that needs to see a doc about it, right? There, there's something going wrong there that they need to have addressed before it's too late. Okay, so, so this is where I think AI can help us today. Um, deep learning for classification. So again, classification basically means it's a X or it's a Y, but what exactly X or Y is depends on how you set up the question. And so you can set up that question in many different ways. Um, one example of that um, is for chest X-rays. 
Uh, this was a very nice study done out of Stanford where they used um, essentially looking for common terms in radiology reports. They didn't have a human look at it for the vast majority of these. They said, just get us in the ballpark of whether the diagnosis is, is uh, present on this chest x-ray. For the test set, they did actually have multiple chest radiologists look at it to say, yeah, that is the correct diagnosis for this chest x-ray. And their conclusion is that AI basically performed at the level of a practicing chest radiologist. And um, they actually did a nice job of producing AUC curves with uh, the confidence intervals. These are all without statistically significant difference except for emphysema. And when I talked with one of the people involved with the study, he said, well, how many of you mention a little bit of emphysema in your routine reports? But during the time that those chest radiologists said, okay, they're watching me to see whether for this perfect test set, right? So, so they basically ratcheted up the bar on the test set. And so that's why they think there was that difference there. But otherwise, you know, for these 14 categories of findings, um, it was not significantly different between the AI tool and, and uh, chest radiologist. Um, another thing that we typically do not do is certainly not something that I learned during my uh, neuroradiology fellowship is to predict molecular markers. Now, sometimes we can get a little bit of a handle on 1P19Q, but things like IDH uh, mutation, um, MGMT methylation, the AI using just routine T2 weighted images of the head, no segmentation, no human involvement, it can predict them with you know, 90 or so percent accuracy. And, and this is multi-institutional, so it's not like it's really tuned in to the way that Mayo, for instance, acquires the images. And again, do I think that we're going to replace pathologists? Because, you know, today this typically is done with tissue. And the answer is no, but kind of like that brain age problem, if we disagree with the pathologist, we need to look at those patients a little bit more closely because pathologists can't look at every cubic millimeter of tissue under the slide. They can't feed every cubic millimeter into a separate test tube for some of these tests, right? So we know that tumors are often heterogeneous. And so if imaging suggests that maybe it's not what pathology said, maybe those patients deserve a little bit more attention. And maybe we can learn more about these uh, patients Maybe there are subcategories that, that uh, we haven't appreciated before. Um, let's see. Oh, this is an example. So again, a, a neuroradiology application, but you probably know that with glioblastoma now with the, the treatment protocol, STU protocol, with giving radiation and temozolomide, a fairly frequent imaging challenge is that they will develop pseudoprogression, where you get enhancement, mass effect, that looks just like tumor recurrence, but it's actually a good thing. Um, the patients who get that are actually these weird GBMs that live for three to five or whatever number of years. So you wanna keep them on temozolomide, but how do you tell the difference? And so we took a really challenging group, ones where basically the radiologist said, I don't know, it's a coin flip. And, and so we trained an AI to try to differentiate them looking at ultimately the, the long-term clinical follow-up as the gold standard. And, you know, we're, we're somewhere around 75% accurate. And, you know, I guess if I was a GBM patient, I'd rather have a 75% accurate guess than a 50-50 guess. Um, you know, I'm optimistic that we're going to improve on this, but I think at least this shows the direction, that there's information there that we humans can't detect that deep learning seems to be able to identify. And so that might improve the care of patients as well. Another cool thing from the orthopedics realm, um, you know, I, an infrequent but big problem for total hip arthroplasty is that something like 2% of patients will dislocate within the first year. And we built a tool that will take the immediate post-op pelvis film where they're looking for things like sponges and whatnot, and we can now figure out at least the 50% who have almost no risk of, of dislocation so that now the 50% that's left behind is a 4% risk. And so again, from a management perspective, it, it says, well, pay a little bit more attention to these. Don't worry as much about those. But also, we think now we can start to figure out what are the features that deep learning is looking at to identify that higher risk group. 
And so the surgeons are saying, hmm, maybe I need to think a little bit more about how I place my cups into the acetabulum, is at least right now what they're thinking. And so again, um, some really cool stuff that, that no one individual could look at, but you know, this is based on thousands of, of pelvis x-rays. Um, another thing that uh, MSK radiologists and, and certainly the, the surgeons that do revisions have to do is figure out the implant that's in place. Because if you don't know exactly what type of implant is in there, then removing it and knowing what the right size is to put the new one in can be a problem. And so we built a tool now that will figure out the implant. This is for THA cups which I understand is really hard to do, that, that basically the orthopods, even orthopods admit they can't figure out cups. Um, and yet we're you know in the high 90s, and for all these different views, right? So especially if you can do multiple views and they all kind of point to the same type of cup, um, that's probably a good sign. For stems, you know, we're even better, right? We're 99.9 .9 for all these different views. And so, and, and again, this is based on something like a 30,000 uh, different subject database. So it's, it's a pretty large data set. Now, that sounds really exciting, right? And, and one important question is, does re remember that loop where we basically say we feed in the image and it figures out what's important. And that raises the question, does AI always find the right features for making a decision? And remember, these things are just dummies that know how to do really good pattern matching, okay? I use dummies in air quotes because sometimes really good pattern matchers is a really good thing to have, right? But it's not intelligent, right? It, it didn't go to med school. It doesn't understand physiology or anatomy. It just knows a lot of examples that it was given. And so an important challenge is that if the number of examples is small, or misleading, as in we have a different type of population, you know, in, we make fun that in Rochester, you know, we're all Norwegian Lutherans, right? That may not be what you see in Florida or California. And so if there are differences in the anatomy or physiology or other things in the populations, that can produce problems. And so that's one of the big issues with deep learning. And it's not just in medicine, um, it happens in a lot of other areas of deep learning as well. And so there's this big challenge of do I trust in, in AI? And for things like segmentation, where it's producing the segmentation of the tumor, usually that's pretty easy for us to do, right? We just plot the overlay and say, yeah, that looks good, or no, nah, I think I'm going to tweak it a little bit there. But for a prediction, like in molecular markers, something that we don't do, we're predicting who's going to dislocate well, you know, basically you need to trust but verify, right? You need to do some sort of long-term follow-up and see if your AI is still getting the predictions right. Unfortunately, that typically means a lot of human effort to do all that follow-up work, and, and that's a big problem. Another interesting thing is uh, adversarial examples. And so uh, in the early days, so this is one of the old slides. I guess I don't have it marked. But we knew that if you added just the right kind of noise, and this is specially engineered noise, and it's accentuated a lot more than in, in real life, but if you added that to an image, you could fake out the AI tool. And this was particularly true if you didn't have, have enough examples. So, you know, just to be a little bit ridiculous, it might say, well, if the pixel value is 222 and then 233 and 234, at location, you know, X, one, two, three, or whatever, then it's a, uh, a panda, but if it's not, then it's a given, right? So if you alter that, that's the, the way that this can happen. And so if you have few enough examples where those sorts of spurious associations become predictive, that's, that's a big problem. And in fact, in the early days of things like self-driving cars, people found that if they put pieces of tape on a stop sign, your Tesla didn't recognize that as a stop sign. And for uh, certain nations where they're concerned about tracking people, they found that if they made these specially co colored paintings, and actually people now sell t-shirts like this, um, it screws up the uh, person recognition software. Okay, Now, just kind of like how there's spy versus spy, these are adversarial examples. 
there's a technology called generative adversarial networks where now you have a whole bunch of images that are um, the thing that you're interested in. So um, in this case, we'll start, first of all, just with pictures of a lot of people off Facebook, for instance. And you also then start with a different AI tool that is a generator where it learns to make pictures ultimately that look like people. And so you have a, a classifier, a discriminator here that tries to figure out, is that a real example or a fake example? And then it gives feedback. And so this thing learns how to make better and better images so that ultimately this discriminator can't tell the difference. That seems like a lot of wasted compute power, right? But it's amazing what can be done. Have, has anybody seen this website before? It's called thispersondoesnotexist.com. You can go to it now if you want. It will keep generating pictures that look for all the world like real people. And this was created by a GAN. How about this? Has anybody heard of deep fakes? Okay, so this is where, um, I didn't mention it, but there's something called a conditional GAN where you can then start to say, I'm not gonna give you pure noise, I'm going to give noise, but a few of the bits I'm going to control and say, this is where their mouth is, or they're smiling, or they have you know um, eyeglasses on or something like that. And so you can condition what the output is. What relevance does this have to medicine? Well, actually, a lot. Um, there is a company out of Stanford called Subtle Medical that will produce images with little or no gadolinium and then use this GAN technology to produce images that look like they had a full dose of GAD. Um, in the case of uh, radiation treatment planning, um, you can make a CT image from the MRI. And so for things like brain tumors, where you can't see the tumor margins on a CT, they often have to fuse a CT with an MR. Well, if you can make a CT for the dose planning purpose from the MR, now you don't need to do the registration. In fact, you don't even need to do the CT. So there's value to the patient, value to the healthcare system. Um, we published a paper where we can make pre-contrast images from post-contrast images, and we can make uh, T2 Im uh, flare images from T2 images. And so again, that, and the reason that that's valuable is that, that, there, that there are then tools that can compute tumor volumes, but they require all four sequences. And what we showed is that we had examples where we had all four, and we got rid of one or two of those sequences, created fake ones, and fed that into the segmentation and showed that there was no difference in the volume. Okay, so now maybe we don't need to acquire all the images that we thought we needed to acquire, which then can be more efficiency or uh, um, you know, it, historical data sets oftentimes don't have everything. So these are just some of the examples of how we can often create images that we would otherwise have to acquire, spend money essentially to acquire. So those were GANs. There's a new technology called DDPMs. So I don't know, has anybody heard of Dolly 2? This is the thing that are, is making really pretty pictures. You put in a text prompt and it will, you know, say, uh, make a picture of an astronaut riding a horse over a moon. And it's amazing what it produces. And, and GANs could not do that sort of a thing, but DDPMs can. So they're a much more reliable, powerful technology than GANs. And so that's something that we've started to play with. So this is one, again, we've got these huge data sets of pelvises, and so we can now create a, a range of pelvises. In this case, it's between uh, white and African-American. Uh, I'm not sure how to play that again, but uh, let's see if I can do it that way. All right, so it's slowly morphing by race, but we can also do it by age, by gender, by body mass index. And so now when you want to create large data sets with an arbitrary population mix, we can do it, and there's no privacy issue, right? Because none of these represents an actual patient. We're not going out searching and saying, ah, there's a patient that's 31 years old or anything. These are all purely generated, kind of like that this person does not exist. So the whole issue around HIPAA and data sharing probably is gone. And since data is so critical to AI, 
This, I think, is going to be a major advance uh, in the, the quality of AI tools. Um, let's see, here's another one. So for the MSK radiologists, using that same GAN technology, you will take, uh, there, there's a large database of images of knee osteoarthritis, and they trained a GAN to predict what the knee would look like several years later and specifically whether there was osteoarthritis progression or not. And uh, let's see, yeah, it's this slide. So here is the reading uh, of a radiologist alone. Essentially, it was a coin flip, right? When it's early on, we have a really hard time predicting whether four years hence there will be osteoarthritis or not. But with this GAN tool, it actually said, yeah, this, this is what it's going to look like. It'll look the same, or this is what it looks like. It's going to be osteoarthritis. And so it had a significant, it's not perfect, but at least it's better than what we radiologists could do alone. And so these generative technologies seem pretty cool and probably, again, will play a role in how we practice medicine. Okay, so again, I hope I got the juices going. Now I'm going to cool you down and say, can I trust AI? And you probably have all seen these saliency maps if you looked at very much of the AI literature. And, and, you know, they're valuable. But the problem is that they only show you where the lesion is. And by the way, you know, there, there's kind of the confirmation bias, right? We all know that's where the pneumonia belongs. How many radiologists would call pneumonia in the left shoulder or at the base of the neck? I don't want to go to you if you do that, right? So, you know, the challenge is that we focus on that because that's where we expect it. But why do these parts of the image light up? And so there's the problem that the saliency maps are not perfect, but also they only tell you the location, all right? So in the case of the brain tumor and predicting molecular markers, I know where the brain tumor is. MRI is pretty good at showing that. But why is it an MGMT methylator or not? And so that's a problem. And so there's this issue of trust, and, and a lot of people describe AI as being a, a black box. Um, it's probably more of a gray box, but one of the important things we need to do is make that more and more translucent to understand what is it looking at. But also, we need to understand a little bit more of how certain is the model. And so this is something now that, that my lab is starting to work on in, in earnest, because I think getting certainty combined with its prediction is critical, right? How many of you read a chest x-ray and say, lung cancer, next case, right? We tend to say terms around it, right? We're, we're radiologists, we like to hedge. That's probably likely to be, could be, is consistent with, right? We have all these words that describe what we think is a probability. That's also a problem because when you say it's consistent with, does that mean it's 100% certain, 90%? 22%. And so getting data sets that we can train an AI on and say this is an 80% probability, that's a problem for us. But, you know, the, the, the main challenge is that if we train a classifier, for instance, to be a pneumonia detector, a dog, and we feed it in something that has both a pneumonia and a lung cancer, it's going to come out with a prediction. And it'll say, you know, pneumonia... 0.95, and again, we look at those numbers and we say, oh, that must be a probability, okay? And most AI vendors give you a number that you think is a probability, and it's not. So that's a big challenge as well. And so uncertainty quantification is the, the $3 term for trying to measure how certain is an AI in the prediction it's making. So you should actually not get just the probabilities, you should get the probability plus an uncertainty component when you get that uh, measurement out of the AI tool. And, you know, if something is really obvious, you may have a very low uncertainty, but if something is much less obvious, then that should be communicated to you, right? But to my knowledge, no AI tool that's out there today does that. And so, again, that doesn't really reflect the reality of our practice. Calibration is another thing that seems like a probability and a certainty level, but it's really not. It's, it's a separate thing. So there's a popular collection of handwritten numbers out there. It was actually used for 
the post office measure or uh, identifying the zip codes. So it's a huge database of handwritten numbers. And we took that, and so this is the number one. And the model is quite, uh, has a high probability or a high score, I should say, coming out that it's a one. But then as you rotate it, now it's not so certain and it might be a two or it might be a five. And then once it get back here, it's a, a one again. But really, you should say, well, you know, here, I'm really uncertain what that thing is. It might be a two, it might be a five, it might be a one, but that needs to be communicated. And so this concept of measuring uncertainty and communicating that out to the radiologist is critical to adoption. And so I think this has to become an element of AI tools that are built and, and the FDA cleared. Um, there needs to be this question of how much is this image like the ones in the training set? And so one example actually that the FDA is really having concerns about is that um, a, a patient came in with a question stroke, a popular AI tool that I know at least one person uses here. Um, the patient moved while they were in the scanner and the AI tool said, there's, a, there's a, an acute stroke. And the patient was, and you know how the notification thing happens, right? It just goes through. Nobody really looks that carefully. It's like hit the stroke team button. And the patient actually had the angio. And they look at it. Oh, there's, there's no embolus here. And about that time, the radiologist report came, images degraded by patient motion. Okay. Now, that tool was only approved for triaging the work list. It was not approved for doing diagnosis. And so I think you're going to see some recalibration of FDA clearances because people just look at the output and they don't have this, this component of, oh, by the way, this image doesn't look like anything that I ever saw before, so don't trust me very much on this one. Um, and then also we need to have a calibrated probability, right? So you'll get a score out, but it needs to be you know, that a 0.8 really means a 0.8 probability, not a 0.8 score. Um, and so, as I mentioned, you know, we don't have real good data sets for what probabilities is, right? When Chris reads a, a chest x-ray and he says, yeah, I think that's probably a lung cancer. I don't know if you ever use the word probab probably in your report, but, you know, does that mean 0 0.6%? 0.6 probability or 0.95. I mean, Chris is really good. He's probably at 0.99. But, you know, if somehow Erickson had to read it, that's probably more like a 0.2 or less, right? So, so that's the problem is that we have non-quantitative language reports, right? We don't have agreed upon values. So the closest thing is BIRATS, right? They do at least try to say when it's a BIRATS 3, that means you know it should be 20% probability or something, but even that's a little bit loose. Um, so again, the AI is all about the data sources. You've got to have data sources that are re representative of the real population. And again, the population we see in Rochester may well be different than what you see in Omaha, may well be different than what you see in Zimbabwe, right? And so the pretest probability, the appearance of disease, all will impact that AI prediction because it didn't go to med school and say, well, here are the, the, the things that are going to be common among all those three sites. And gee, I haven't seen something like that before. That may be some unique disease in Zimbabwe, so I'm going to be extra careful about it. So really, data is the new oil. And um, kind of like oil, you need to think about how am I going to refine it, right? So we collect these large data sets. Probably two thirds of my research budget is refining the data, going through the you know the pseudo progression thing. It took us months to look at each case and say, yeah, that was truly progression. That was not true progression. That was somewhere in the middle, so we're going to throw it out, right? We went over we went through over a thousand exams to find the 200 or so that we could actually use in that training example. So it's expensive, but also it takes a lot of expertise. You also have to have enough. And the amount that's required is task dependent because this, the signal is ultimately what matters. And if we don't even know what the signal is, like in pseudoprogression, how can I tell you prospectively how many it will take? 
And then it also needs to be privacy protected. And, and again, that, that's an obvious one for anybody who knows about HIPAA. Um, in case you're curious, um, my lab recently published a, a series of three articles on how research labs like mine deal with these uh, bias issues. And there's so many subtle ways that it can enter in. And if you don't catch it, you will produce a tool that will work well on your research data set, but will fail when you get into clinical practice. And so you really have to be like a detective trying to think of all the ways that it could fail. Um, I've heard lots of acronyms for AI. And you know, while artificial intelligence is the obvious one, um, it has an alarming level of invasion that's possible. Did you know that they're now seeing that not only is the face identifiable, but they can look at the bones of a chest x-ray and figure out who the person is. They can take a PET scan and figure out who the person is. So there is an amazing amount of information and images that blows past at least my retinas. I know I couldn't look at a chest x-ray and figure out who, who it belonged to, but AI tools seem to be able to do that. Um, it has amazing individualization, right? That's kind of the yin and yang of that problem is that you can start to get very precise personalized medicine that's possible out of that. And then, of course, you've also heard of some of these really stupid predictions. In fact, uh, when we were at the FDA meeting, a guy said, yeah, you know, we decided to take a mammography image of a pickle, and we ran that through the AI, and it confirmed there was no cancer in the pickle. Okay? <laughs> so that gets to the problem again that AI doesn't have a sense of, that doesn't even look like anything I've ever seen before. It'll just reliably give you a prediction and you have to have the neurons to figure out whether it makes sense. Okay, um, just briefly now, AI can also help a lot with workflow efficiency. So this is actually the broader type of AI. Um, it's actually uh, improving things like, you know, better image acquisition. Um, I was talking with Paul back there on, you know, some of the cool things happening with um, MR and CT acquisitions. Um, you can do things like very limited acquisition time MR, and with deep learning, you basically teach it how to produce high resolution images. Um, I don't know how many of you have iPhones. Um, but I think this also is true with uh, Android, but if you keep zooming in, you'll see it be a little bit blurred for a while, and then suddenly it will pop sharp, okay? That's beyond the resolution of the pixels in the image, but deep learning knows how to make an image that looks like it's really high resolution even when that resolution doesn't exist. And we can do the same thing with medical images. Um, we can also train it to make really high quality uh, CT images from low dose, right? So here's a full dose CT, here's the quarter dose CT, and here's the deep learning recon from the 25% dose. And you know, it almost looks fake there because there's such good suppression of noise, but We've seen a few examples now where really subtle liver lesions can, can pop or at least become visible and uh, they turn out to be real. And um, you can also do uh, things like interpolation. So like we can make one millimeter MR slices out of five millimeter thick slices using that same sort of super resolution technique. So I think there's a lot of possibility here. This is actually showing more about that. And so you know, this is showing the, the typical jaggies, right, the edges that are present. This is if you do tricubic interpolation. This was one of the early deep learning methods, and this is the one that we have, you know, and it, it really looks nice and smooth even, even when you zoom it up. And so this is the sort of technology that's going to make much better quality images in much less time. Um, so I just saw this very recently. I think this is maybe a couple weeks old. But um, what they did is for functional MR, they trained a, uh, a DDPM or one of these generative type networks to look at the RF signals out of a, a seven Tesla MR scanner. And they had patients think about an airplane or think about a building or you know think about a, a field or whatever. And the AI taking the RF sequences, here are the four different subjects you know, those look pretty much like airplanes as opposed to buildings or, or other things. Deep learning figured that out, right? It just got the RF signal and yet there's pretty, pretty reasonable agreement of what they were supposed to think about 
and what the AI generated from that, from those RF signals. So it's really scary sometimes what's possible. Okay, um, again, just to, to suppress all the excitement, um, you know, it challenges that these tools are very good at one narrow task, right? So if you build a COVID pneumonia detector, it will not necessarily do Klebsiella pneumonia and it won't differentiate the two. And so a challenge is, are we going to build, you know, 10,000 different AI algorithms for each of the different things that a radiologist needs to do? And so this, this is the problem that Hinton hadn't appreciated is that there are so many different things and we need to uh, figure out how are we going to put this into practice. And really it becomes a prioritization problem then is that we have to figure out what are the important problems where we're willing to integrate those results in. Because I know at least I don't have time to integrate 10,000 different AI results into my report. Okay, so somebody asked me, maybe he's not here anymore, did he disappear? Um, you know, is AI going to replace radiologists, right? And this is a question that's been out there forever. And, and uh, I think, you know, most people agree now it's not whether AI will replace it, it's whether AI helping a human will replace the human who says, I don't need AI. And I, you know, I think that that for many tasks is, is probably pretty clear. So, so don't focus on whether they're going to replace us. Focus on how do we use AI to extract the valuable information that's present in these images to help us care for patients better. There's a lot more information than what my retinas at least can perceive. And, and I suspect that that's probably true for others. And, and so we need to make sure that we work with the AI scientists to make sure that the AI implementation is optimal for the care of patients, right? Hopefully we learned that with EHRs, that a lot of those implementations were suboptimal. We need to you know, be in the face of the IT people to make sure that these get implemented the right way. So, you know, there's this Gartner hype curve, and so in the early days, you know, Hinton was here, you know, deep learning is this great new technology, deep learning could do anything. Um, probably in the last couple of years, we've been kind of more in the deep learning can't do anything. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, we're probably going to get to this sort of a phase where we say that deep learning can help. Now, in 2023, no AI talk is complete without ChatGPT. Has, has everybody heard of ChatGPT? Anybody not heard of it? Okay. So I, this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with radiology, but I'll talk to it anyway. Um, so it is a generative technology. So that's in this new family of cool stuff that produces things that we think are valuable. Um, it was trained on data primarily from 2021 and earlier. Okay, so it doesn't really know much about what has happened since that time. Um, it uses something called temperature annealing to provide lifelike senses rather than the robotic thing. So if you've ever used it, you may have seen that regenerate button, where for the same prompt, it will give you a similar thing. And, and the way it works is that for the prompt, it will start to come up with two or three words. And then it basically uses probability and says, when I see these three words, nearly always the next word is this. But the temperature annealing says, yeah, but 80% of the time it's that, but now I'm gonna throw in a surprise and you know pick something else just to you know, give a little bit of life to the sentence. Okay, so that's where you can actually control. If you want a purely robotic type uh, report, you would put temperature annealing to zero. And if you want something that's really all over the place, um, you would put it much higher. Um, it can be factually wrong, but it has such a strong sense of reality to it that it seems like it must be right. And so there are a lot of these examples, you know, where kids use it to write their homework papers, but the homework paper is wrong because it didn't have the facts right, perhaps because of this. And again, the data that's used is whatever is out there on the internet. So if it happened to pick an internet site that was wrong, its results are going to be wrong, right? Again, this is not intelligent, it is just regurgitating patterns. Okay, so I thought it might be interesting and I'm gonna have to look at this or, or uh, so I said, 
write a poem admiring the Nebraska Radiological Society. And it says, in the rolling plains of the Midwest where the golden wheat fields crest, stands a society of radiological might whose prowess and skill shine bright. The Nebraska Radiological Society, a beacon of knowledge and expertise, their dedication to experts' care is a testament to their noble beliefs. With cutting-edge technology and care, they help diagnose and heal with flair. From MRIs to X-rays bright, their expertise brings hope and light. Their members are a remarkable group. A new year, whose expertise and dedication make them leaders in their field and a source of inspiration. Oh, Nebraska Radiological Society, we admire your commitment to care. Your excellence in radiology is truly beyond compare. So, congratulations, they knew you. <laughs> um, so then, just you know, to understand a little bit of the, the uh, reality, I don't know if you've also heard about this, but if you ask it to create a poem admiring Joe Biden, it will do a very nice job with that. If you ask it to write a poem admiring Donald Trump, it says we don't step into politics. Uh, same thing with uh, Gavin Newsom. He's an amazing governor. Ron DeSantis has been associated with harmful actions, so we don't comment. So, <laughs> so not everything is after 2021, and, and there's obviously a lot of debate in the field about this. Okay, so um, I hope that this has been uh, educational and, and valuable to you. I just want you to remember a few points. One is that AI is incredibly powerful and really it's about the imagination. I, I get a feed of all the AI papers published and it's amazing what people think, how to structure questions so that deep learning can answer some really cool questions. Um, in some cases, we won't understand the basis for the decision. And it may be subtle textures or complex interplays of features between images. Um, and we also have to be careful that those features and predictions can lead to unintended consequences. And I think that measuring uncertainty is critical to adoption. And, and until we get that right, probably AI is not going to go a long way. Um, I think AI is not going to replace radiologists or any doctor in the foreseeable future. There's this saying that if a computer can replace your doctor, then your doctor should be replaced. Um, AI can improve quality of care, and it can simultaneously improve efficiency. We just have to figure out how to implement it right. And AI will likely, sorry, yeah, AI will likely always have components of human bias since it just reflects the data that's generated by humans. And so, we need to be careful about how these tools are applied so that we take the best care of patients possible. So um, I'm fortunate to have a wonderful lab of people who did a lot of the work that I refer to. If you're interested in actually starting to understand more about how AI works, we've uh, created this medical imaging deep learning uh, website where you can actually run code, grab our code, build it out for your own purposes. Um, and again, I'm happy. We, we do also have a Twitter feed, and so we do things like debates and, and publish those as well. So if you're wanting to learn more, that's one way to do it. So happy to try to answer any questions. No questions? Yeah? Is there much work in terms of uh, blending data streams, I guess, where you're you know, your EMR is feeding data into what the image is showing? Yeah, so um, when you combine different types of data, that's called a multimodal AI, <clears throat> and that's, that is a big challenge. And um, so now I'll step on to my statement that I wouldn't talk about my company, but my company is actually geared towards getting into multimodal because I think that's where we're going next, right? You can look at an MR of the head and you'll see spots, but knowing the age of the patient, knowing the gender of the patient, you can say, oh yeah, that might be MS, that might be vascular disease, might be metastases, right? Clinical history is critical. And all of the tools that I know of today are just the pixels. And if we can start to add in more information, I think that's going to improve things. But that's a challenging problem, and that, that's what that company is about. So, yeah, I think that's I think that is where things have got to go. How about change over time? 
Yeah, so change over time is a similar problem. It's maybe not as complex to model, but um, yeah, there are change. Actually, one of the very early projects in my lab was change detection for brain tumors. And, you know, that's clearly a problem, but you got to pull the right prior examination together, you got to line them up, and then you got to learn what the patterns are that reflect good or bad change. Other questions? How do you see this playing out with, um, you know, potential scope expansion battles with mid-levels using this as a way to take over position um, spots, I guess? So, so I was talking with a few people before the meeting, you know, AI is good at the very stereotypical straight-up cases. I think, if anything, it's going to be a more of a challenge to the mid-level providers because they don't have as broad an education to say, oh yeah, this is one of these far outliers that AI is never going to recognize. And But you know, hopefully you learn enough in med school of residency and whatnot to say, oh yeah, that, that's one of those things that you never want to miss, but it only happens you know, once in a career. And I think it's, well, that's, to me at least, what you give up when you have a mid-level provider is, I think, in general, the ones I've seen are phenomenal with interpersonal. So I think once the diagnosis is done, they tend to be very good at cajoling, encouraging, getting people to do what they need to do. But I think the diagnostic task is one where you got to know about everything that's possibly out there. So I think, actually, we're probably not going to be displaced by mid-levels with AI. I think instead it's more likely to be the primary care docs that can be displaced. Good question. Anything else? Any debates? Disagreements? That's how we learn is by saying, you're wrong about that, right? <laughs> Sorry, I have another question. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about how it's only as good as the data that you're feeding it. So, I mean, just thinking about in broader terms how, um, you know, clinical trials tend to only have a very specific data from a specific group of people, then how, how are you addressing that issue of, of not having enough diversity in their data? Yeah, no, that, that's exactly the problem. It's not only diversity, but usually when it's on clinical trials, they know they can only check, you know, one or two or three check boxes. Whereas in the real world, you know, it's like, oh, it's just always a one, right? So I think the input data, particularly when we're starting to do the non-pixel data input, usually is not as carefully done in the clinic as it is in a clinical trial. Because clinical trial, trials are prospective, they say you've got to fit in the form. And most clinical care is not done that way. So, so that's one big problem is we, we call that drift, that the data that's used to train the model doesn't really look like the data that we use in practice. And also, as we have more understanding or we say, oh, yeah, you know, I thought that was a one, but now it's a two, there's also change over time for that reason as well. So it's not just a data diversity that, in some respects, that's less of an issue because you capture that, right? You know what the diversity of your population is. So that's kind of a recognized problem up front. It's these more subtle things of the curation of the data and how the data is collected that is often much cleaner in clinical trials than it is in everyday medical practice. And, and that's, my guess, would be the bigger challenge. Chris? <laughs> I should have said before blurting out my question that that was really an excellent talk and, and thank you. Um, it, it seems to me that it would be, uh, uh, it could change the face of screening, you know, and how do you see it in, in that and, and, and almost in a way making a patient of ever, making everybody a patient, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, I'm a healthy individual, but 
Now AI tells me I'm a 25% unhealthy individual. And yeah, so I just by all of these different measures. And, yeah. yeah. So, so I guess there are kind of two different senses of screening, right? So when you said screening, my first thought was mammography or chest x-rays. And I do think that's a good application for AI because particularly things like screening mammography, you're not looking for broken bones and hair under the diaphragm, right? It pretty much is there cancer or not. And so that problem of the weird diseases is really rare in, in mammography. So that's a good example. But the problem, of course, is that if the reimbursement system doesn't change and the humans only get left with the problematic, challenging diagnostic cases because AI has taken off all the easy ones. Oh, and by the way, government isn't going to pay for an AI reading because we all know that's just a few CPU cycles, a couple cents of electricity, right? So, so we have to understand how that's going to work if, if we humans are left with the tough stuff. We need to get paid more for that. Now to your other question about, you know, I'm a 25% healthy. So that's things like, you know, watches or, or the, all these um, data sources that we're collecting more and more. And I think that that is something that's likely to, to happen is that I know that there are companies who are collecting information well beyond what the Apple Watch can do. Um, but, um, you know, things like heart rate variability is a reasonable predictor. The rumor is that the next Apple Watch will have a gluco glucose uh, measurement. Um, and, you know, when you get those sorts of capabilities, um, those are probably pretty valuable indicators of how healthy a person is. So AI is really more kind of the processor, right? That That's the way that you can get an EKG out of a, a watch or a glucose level. There's AI in there. How you use that data may or may not involve AI. Um, you'd have to collect data for a long time in order to say, oh yeah, and now with AI we can see this. But even before that, I think, you know, if you saw that a certain population had consistently high glucose levels, and you know, the only way to measure it is because they now are wearing a watch, but when you come in for, you know, a fasting blood glucose or something like that, that that's an important thing for population health care. Did that answer your question? Or? Yeah, I was kind of thinking in terms of your uh, predictive age of each organ, uh, and you know, now am I going to go in and get a whole body MR and it's going to tell me, you know, all yes, the different parts. You should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I. You know, at this point, I think it's more incidental. Uh, you know, so much of the population has had a CT for some reason or other. And I think if we can start to do it with ultrasound, um, you know, there are these butterfly devices where you can get an ultrasound off your iPhone, and those are coming down in price. And, you know, again, for at least some major organs, you can probably get reasonable numbers out of that. So, it, yeah, it, it's kind of, there's a lot of information there, and, and we need to figure out how to mine that more effectively. So that's maybe not screening, but it's more predictive medicine that, that can be fortuitously collected. Yeah. So since it's new technology, don't get a new kind of legal regulatory environment that has to be constructed. Are there ways physicians can work to try and direct that into a more productive, you know? set of regulations as opposed to those that might be otherwise? Yeah, so um, up to this point, the FDA has largely viewed this as a medical device like a CT or MR scan. So as long as the software does what it claims, <clears throat> then, you know, that's fine. So in the same way that if somehow a CT or MR scanner had an artifact so that you know, it looked just like a bleed, but it really wasn't. If the software was misleading, but it performed according to spec, you would not be held responsible because the device had failed. So, so that's why I think, you know, today's generation of tools is really not acceptable for medical care because you don't get that certainty component. I think once you start to say, oh yeah, you know, this, this is a head bleed, and it looks just like, you know, the three million images that I was trained on, or 
Yeah, it could be a head bleed, but it doesn't look like every, anything I've seen before, right? So, so that's the difference is that when you see a CT or an MR, usually you can tell there's something funky going on and you can say, let's repeat that series or, you know, let's do X, Y, or Z to it. Um, the, the challenge is that with today, today's AI is it, for the most part, you get, just get a number out. Um, I think it's a step forward. A lot of them now will say, this is the part of the image that I thought was relevant. So I think that that's helpful. But again, if, if we have these things where the AI automatically sets a whole cascade of events before somebody looks at it, that's a problem. So that's a long-winded way of saying, it really isn't settled exactly how this is gonna work, but from the government perspective, it's a device just like any other medical device, and so as long as you use it as within as it was spec'd out to be used, then you're covered. Doesn't mean a patient can't sue you, but you know, the, the, theoretically, you should be found not responsible because you used the device the way it was supposed to be used. So, like a lot of I think what they are, are things you encounter, you know, the, in, on the internet, for example, take user interactions with it and feed it back in and improve the, the algorithm and stuff. It seems like medical applications are doing that way. I'm guessing it's regulatory, but I, are there other reasons for that? Or, you know, it's like you have CAD for breast row, and it's like once and now it's that way forever, kind of, right? Like, you know, right. So, um, you do see incremental releases as they get better and more data, they'll retrain the model, and then that will be a, you know, a dot one release where they'll you know, improve the model. But it, it, it's not a continuously learning thing where you know, yesterday it said this and today it's saying that, and you didn't know that there was anything going on. You would have to you know, do an upgrade to the software just like you do on a CT or MR scanner, and you know, the results may or may not be different. They would have to go through the FDA clearance process just like they did with the first version. And you know, the FDA would use whatever techniques it uses to say, yeah, that is an improvement over the prior version. So the FDA's problem, of course, is where do they get their data to test it? All right, so there are actually efforts underway to collect data sets that nobody can know about because obviously then the manufacturer could tune their algorithm to that data. So um, they are collecting private data sets, which are the ones used then in, in testing for, for clearance purposes. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.